Okay, welcome everyone to the fifth lecture of digital design and computer architecture. Uh, we're going to talk about, we're going to continue talking about combinational logic uh, today uh, and hopefully finish combinational logic today. Clearly, it's an exciting topic because we have many combinational blocks in existing processors and systems. Uh, so let me start uh, by reminding some assignments. This is a required le lecture video. You can watch one or both and you can review them. And uh, somebody asked about the deadline last time. So we decided that the deadline should be April 5th, which gives you enough time uh, to hopefully watch and review the video uh, or videos, let's say. Hopefully it'll be fun for people to watch. Uh, and I'm looking forward to your comments on it. I read these every year. Okay, and the required readings. Uh, so this week, uh, we're going to cover combinational logic and sequential logic. Uh, so I put combinational logic as readings today, but feel free to do the sequential logic readings as well, because we hope to cover tomorrow. Uh, but uh, hold on on the tomorrow's lecture for now, because we might need to reschedule it. Uh, and you can still watch it, of course, when it's uh, really uh, uh, online. Uh, OK, and by the end of next week, please make sure you're done with uh, these chapters, uh, as I mentioned. OK. so. Clearly, we were looking at general purpose microprocessors, and all of these are built by combinational as well as sequential components. Uh, today, we're going to finish the combinational components. So you're going to see a lot of the components that make up these processors. And there are many different types of processors, as we have seen last time. I'm going to go through these to jog your memory. Uh, clearly, we've covered a bunch of these in some level last time and earlier times also. But essentially, they all look the same. If you remember last lecture, we said they all look the same. And they are actually built by similar basic components, uh, as we will see partly today. So we, uh, last time, we also started combinational logic circuits and design. Uh, and we're going to continue that. Basically, uh, we're, uh, last time, we covered uh, transistors. We started with transistors and built logic gates on top of them. On top of that, we started building combinational circuits, but we didn't get to that much. But we talked a lot about Boolean algebra. Today, we're going to talk about how to use Boolean algebra to represent combinational circuits and talk about minimizing logic circuits. And we're going to look a lot into combinational building blocks of modern systems. And these uh, slides, until slide 27 or so, are going to be essentially review. So I'm going to really breeze through them because we covered all of these in a good amount of detail. Uh, on uh, last time in the last lecture. Uh, okay, I had to remove some window, uh, which is the uh, admitting people to window. If, we, if, we, if someone can tend to admit, admitting people, that'd be great quickly. Otherwise it stays on my screen a lot. Uh, uh, basically we started with a, a transistor, a metal oxide semiconductor transistor, if you remember. And we built basic logic structures out of individual transistors, and we call them logic gates. And if you remember, these are the basic logic gates uh, we talked about, uh, a NOT gate, an AND gate, and an AND gate. Uh, and you can see the truth tables. Uh, truth table is the representation of the logic gate in terms of its inputs and outputs. And for every combination of input value, you get uh, a result in the output value, as you can see over here. Uh, and this, uh, the, at the bottom, you can see the transistor level, CMOS, complementary metal oxide semiconductor transistor level uh, representations uh, of these gates. And these are uh, uh, some other logic gates, which we don't show the uh, transistor level representations because as we said, we're, we're going to abstract it away. We're gonna talk about logic gates uh, going forward. Uh, OK, and we started talking about Boolean equations. Uh, Boolean equations are essentially functional specification of outputs in terms of inputs. And you remember, we defined the function. In this case, combinational functions have no memory. That's the distinction between combinational and sequential functions. Sequential functions have memory, and we're going to talk about that in the next lecture. And this is one bit adder, which we're going to get to see uh, more of uh, in, in, the, in the later uh, slides. Uh, okay, and we talked about uh, some of these gates. I'm not going to talk about it. And we talked about Boolean algebra, different axioms of Boolean algebra. And you've seen it in high school at some point. So uh, hopefully you remember all of this anyway, uh, even if you didn't watch the last lecture. And we talked about the principle of duality in Boolean algebra. You can remember that. Again, we talked about useful laws that enable us to uh, minimize things or reduce uh, algebraic expressions. Uh, 
which enables us to actually reduce or minimize the logic gates uh, that we use to implement a function also, as we will see today. But you can also guess, right? If you have, for example, x and x bar as input your AND gate, the output is 0. So you can replace that AND gate with just a 0 uh, value, right? Uh, OK, and we also talked about some simplification theorems, which are really useful. Uh, for example, uh, number 9 over here shows that uh, you can get rid of y and y bar, and the function is just x, because the function is independent of y if uh, this is true, right? And the last one, the second one is also very useful because it appears in many, many cases uh, when you do logic design, which is really interesting. And we might see that in a little bit. And there, of course, we can prove these using Boolean algebra, right? But we also will see how you can do this sort of minimization uh, in different ways. Okay, so you can prove things as you can see, as we showed earlier, though this is a reduction, for example, if you have a circuit that looks like this for some reason, x, x and y or x and y bar, you can go through a Boolean algebra and reduce it to x, as you can see. And you can do the same thing for the other theorem we discussed. We also talked about the Morgan's laws. Uh, basically, the Morgan's law says, uh, in this expression, it says that if at least one of ABC is true, it is not the case that ABC are all false. So it's very logical, as you can see. That's why it's just called logic. Uh, and basically, you can represent uh, things both ways, right? You can either say at least one of ABC is true, or you can say, it's not the case that ABC are all false. And when this matters is really when you have different types of gates in your library, for example, and you, when you want to uh, convert, when you want to use some uh, type of gate, for example, you, in your implementation, uh, you may only have NAND gates, right? This way you can convert uh, uh, NOR gates to NAND gates, for example, and NAND gates to NOR gates, uh, et cetera, and NAND gates to OR gates. So it really depends basically what you want to, uh, optimize for because some some gates might be faster than others. We discussed, for example, NOR gates could be quite fast. So you might actually want to implement things with NORs, and you can use the Morgan's laws to convert NANDs to NORs, for example. Okay, so this is where we stopped actually last time. This was all uh, a quick review of what we've done in the last lecture. Now let's take a look at how we can use Boolean equations to represent the logic circuit in a more methodical way. Clearly, you can guess. We, we already clearly represented circuits, right? Uh, clearly, this is a circuit, for example, and we can reduce it in some way. Uh, but we want to be more methodical in how we represent things, and we want to use that methodical representation to enable us to minimize things in a much uh, more methodical, hopefully automated way. So, and, and the key idea here is really you can, you can methodically represent any truth table, any function, uh, using uh, a, a canonical representation. So one of the canonical representations we will talk a lot about is sum of products form. I'll give you the key idea first, and we, we're going to see some examples. So assume we have a, the truth table of a Boolean function. Then the question we ask is, how do we express the function in terms of the inputs in a standard manner? Uh, essentially, uh, we're going to use a very standard methodology to express any function. And the idea of sum of products form is uh, to express the truth table as a two-level Boolean expression. Uh, where uh, uh, the expression contains all input variable combinations that result in a one output or true output. One is equal to true also in logic. If any of the combinations of input variables that results in a one is true, then the output is one. Basically, we're going to enumerate all combinations of input variables that result in a one, and we're going to OR them. Essentially, that's the idea of the sum of products one. Uh, F function will be represented as uh, the OR of all input variable combinations, meaning AND of all input variables, we will see, that result in a 1. OK, so let me go, go into a little bit more formalism over here, because if you formalize this, then you can actually build tools that can automatically do this, and then automatically use uh, Boolean algebra laws or uh, some other uh, simplification heuristics so that they can simplify this canonical uh, form. Uh, in a formal way. And this is really the basis of the comp computer-aided design tools uh, that we use today. These are also called logic synthesis tools. You can basically input truth tables, uh, functions, or even Boolean equations to them. And they basically convert things to these canonical forms. And then they basically apply uh, the Boolean algebra uh, theorems uh, and axioms and actually simplification rules and heuristics to actually get rid of as many uh, gates as possible given an optimization criteria. Sometimes they actually can minimize the logic delay as well, assuming you know the logic delay of the gates and you want to actually minimize the logic delay. So basically, this is very powerful. If you can represent things formally, 
you can really uh, minimize your logic, minimize your delay, minimize your power. Of course, you need to know uh, uh, how to map the Boolean expression uh, to a small a, a set of gates uh, with different properties. So computer-aided design tools are actually quite powerful today uh, to be able to do that. They're very good at doing this with sim relatively simple functions. When you scale them to really, really large functions, they become a little bit tougher, uh, especially if you want to design multiple metrics. But uh, everything that we're going to talk about is, has really enabled uh, computer-aided computer -aided design. So keep that in mind. OK, so we're going to define some things. Basically, complement, you already know. This is a variable with a bar over it, a naught, b naught, c naught. Literal is a variable or its complement. Basically, a or a bar, that's a literal. a, b, or b bar is a literal. A implicant is the product of literals. So for example, a, b, c bar is a product of the literals, as you can see, uh, the input variables. OK, min term is going to be important for the sum of products form. This is really the product or end that includes all input variables of a function. So if a function has a, b, c as input variables, this is one min term in that function. Basically, uh, this min term is a, b, c bar, meaning that it's, uh, it, 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 it's, uh, it has a value of one if a is true, b is true, and c is uh, false. Right? And we will see this. Basically, it really gives you a line in the truth table. OK, uh, max term will be important when we talk about product of sums forms. Basically, this is the sum or or that includes all input variables, as you can see. So a plus b bar plus c bar. And we will talk about the max term later. For now, let's focus on the min term, because I'm going to introduce the sum of products form. Once you understand sum of products, product of sums is really uh, the dual of it. OK, so basically, we have these two level canonical standard forms. Uh, essentially, uh, the observation is that truth table is the unique signature of a Boolean function. And it's any Boolean function has a truth table, of course. But of course, it's an expensive representation, right? Uh, a Boolean function can have many alternative Boolean expressions. Uh, in other words, many alternative Boolean expressions and gate realizations may have the same truth table and function as a result. So these mean the same thing. Basically, this means that uh, essentially there may be many representations of a function. Why do we care? Clearly, I already said this, different Boolean expressions uh, of the same function lead to different gate level realizations, right? And we care about this because different gate level realizations have a direct impact on the area, power, delay, et cetera, as we, as we have already talked about and as we will talk about even more uh, later. So a canonical form is really, uh, it, it, it really tries to clear this mess. It basically says, I have one standard form for a Boolean expression, and that's it. And I'm going to start with that, and I'm going to try to optimize that. Basically, it's a unique algebraic signature uh, given uh, the definition of the standard. OK, so there are two standards, sum of products and product of sums. Uh, basically, sum of products form is also known as disjunctive normal form or min term expansion. This min term expansion will be very clear soon. Basically, the, the key idea is at the bottom over here in the slide, if you see over here, find all the input combinations or min terms for which the output of the function is true. True means set to one, basically. OK. So we're going to find all of those, which are, uh, let me try to uh, do my, uh, how do I do it? Annotate. OK, there you go. That, that looks better. A spotlight over here. OK, I got my spotlight. Basically, it's all these, uh, these last five rows over here are set to one, meaning that the min, term, uh, min terms are true. OK, so basically, we're going to pick all of those. Uh, and we're going to look at uh, the input combinations. So we're going to take all of the min terms. Min term means basically essentially these. So there are five min terms, five different input combinations, uh, where the function evaluates to one. So for the function to evaluate to one, any of them should be true. Now, what does that give us? We enumerate the input combinations. A, B, C should be 0, 1, 1. Basically, the function evaluates to one if A, B, C is equal to 0, 1, 1, or if it's equal to 1, 0, 0 or if it's equal to 101, or if it's equal to 110, or if it's equal to 111. And that's it, basically. That's your min term expansion, if you will, as you can see over here. We basically find all the min terms where the output evaluates to 1 and or them, and represent the min terms not with 011, but basically uh, the uh, implicants, as we discussed earlier uh, in, in the formal terminology. So the implicant that corresponds to input combination 011 is 
a bar b c because this is this becomes a one if uh, a is zero b is one and c is one and that's an end right okay hopefully this is clear right this is basic boolean algebra again and basically we can represent this function this way and this is a standard representation of this function where these min terms evaluate to one. And clearly there may be many functions that uh, look like this, but this is really the standard representation. So, okay, let me go over this a little bit more. So each row in a truth table has a min term. A min term is a product of literals. Remember the literals, literal is A or A bar, uh, any input in its complement. Each min term is true for that row and only that row because there's only, there, it's, it, it corresponds to a unique input combination. There's no other A bar B C in this truth table. There's only one place because truth table by nature enumerates all two to the n combinations uh, of uh, inputs, right? Okay, so all Boolean equations basically can be written in this SOP sum of products form. And this is very powerful for any truth table, uh, any Boolean equation, you can write this. Now we have a very clean place to start. Now we can actually take this equation and reduce it using Boolean algebra rules or some other rules as we will discuss hopefully at the end. So why does it work very quickly? So once we have expressed this function like this, basically you can check that this works. Uh, as I said earlier, the function evaluates to true. In other words, the output is one. Uh, if any of the products or min terms causes the output to be one, right? So that's why it works, hopefully. Uh, so let's take a look at uh, that. For example, uh, this min term corresponds to uh, this line in the truth table. Uh, and the function is true if a is one, b is zero, and c is one. And clearly we have to have a term in the sum of products form to activate that particular row. This is also called activation of that row, let's say. So basically if you give this input combination, one, zero, one to a, b, c, it activates this min term or this term, let's say in the SOP form, and then the function evaluates to one, regardless of what, are, what, are, what other min terms are, right? But clearly this input activates only this min term and nothing else because uh, this is a unique combination uh, of inputs. Okay, so basically only the shaded product term over here will be one. This is just to aid you in your studies. No other product terms will turn on, they will all be zeros. So if inputs A, B, C correspond to a product term in the expression, uh, we get essentially one for that min term and all zeros for the other uh, min terms over here. Uh, so if inputs A, B, C do not correspond to any product term in the expression, you get all zeros. For example, if A, B, C are all zeros, you don't have any min term corresponding to A bar, B bar, C bar over here. As a result, you will not get a one at the, as the output of this function. So hopefully that's clear. Okay, so this is basically the notation for the sum of products. It's, uh, it's a standard, you can actually uh, express this as a standard shorthand notation by agreeing on the order of variables in the rows of the truth table. Uh, so if you agree on this order of variables uh, and uh, let's say represent them as min term one, min term two, min term three, min term zero, et cetera, then you can enumerate each row with the decimal number that corresponds to the binary number created by the input pattern. So this will become much more clear once I show you an example uh, in a little bit. Uh, okay, so basically, if you look over here, uh, one zero zero is decimal four. So we can call this min term number four or M four, small M four, as you can see over here. Uh, so one one one, for example, is decimal seven. So this is min term number seven. In a three input function, uh, clearly this is min term number seven. And uh, you can represent that as M seven. So a function can be represented as essentially, yeah, min term three, min term four, min term five, min term six, min term seven. It's really the or of M3, M4, M5, M6, M7. So this is really the sum of products as you can see. Or you can use a summation notation also, in arith just like in arithmetic, uh, people use it to even make it more compact. Basically, this is the sum of min terms, three, four, five, six, seven, okay? So hopefully that's clear. Okay, I see one uh, question. I don't know if it's handled, but... Uh... No, I don't see it anymore. I don't know why. So uh, the question says, shouldn't we use and or and? So essentially that's it, right? We're using and or and. So uh, let me go back over here. Uh, that's what we're doing over here. So this is the end of uh, A bar B bar B C. And then you have the or, and then end of A B bar C bar, and then you have an or, and then end of A B bar C. So basically each midterm is really 
a, a, an AND function. That's what it may, that's what makes the midterm essentially. And plus is an or, uh, plus is an or. No, somebody asked plus is an XOR, right? No, plus is an or. So if, if you remember uh, the representations uh, earlier, uh, when, we, when we discussed the Boolean algebra roles, we said that uh, dot, uh, uh, dot is, a, is an AND and plus is an OR. Uh, and XOR is plus with a circle. Exactly, I think one of the students uh, mentioned that. Okay, so if, you, if, you, if you're confused, go back to the picture that I showed you earlier. Uh, where it shows uh, all of these different gates uh, where we discussed uh, how they are represented. Okay, okay. so this is a canonical form, basically. Uh, any three input function looks like this. And basically three input functions differ in terms of which min terms are activated or become one. So this is a shorthand notation for min terms of three variables, as you can see, with a small m. So f in canonical form, uh, the previous f we have seen is this, basically. Okay, we already discussed this. And then you can actually expand this canonical form. Once you agreed on the terms, you know exactly what min term three, min term four, min term five, min term six, min term seven uh, refers to. And basically, if you're given a representation like this, you can expand the Boolean expression like this because you know exactly which rows of the truth table they correspond to. And then you can start minimizing. Okay, canonical form clearly is not the minimal form. In fact, it's, I don't want to call it the maximal form because you can always keep adding terms to make it bigger. But in a sense, it's the, it's the standard form, and it's, it's essentially, uh, without adding more redundancy, it's the maximal standard form. Uh, so, OK, so if you want to minimize it, now you start applying Boolean algebra laws. Uh, for example, you take out a b bar, and then you see that c and c bar. Uh, so in these terms, for example, this term and this term, you can eliminate c over here. And then you can eliminate c over here also. So basically, you get this one. And then you later realize that these two, you can eliminate b, right? And then you later realize that you can eliminate also uh, uh, a, a bar over here. So you get A plus B, C. So clearly, you can apply Boolean algebra laws to minimize the circuit. And this looks quite good compared to this mess over here. But we will see that this mess is actually useful when you're programming programmable logic. So this is going to be very important when we talk about programmable logic arrays, for example, or lookup tables, as we will see. So whenever you're programming an FPGA, for example, this could be useful for lookup tables. Of course, you could minimize the size of your lookup table or programmable logic if you minimize the expression as well. Uh, but some lookup tables and some programmable uh, logic uh, operate by enumerating all possible combinations of inputs. And we will see how this could be useful in those contexts. And in the end, uh, by doing this transformation simplification, you can have a two-level and an or uh, uh, gate uh, realization of this function. Of course, you can, you can convert this A plus BC to, an, to a NAND gate realization or NOR gate realization using the other combinations in Boolean algebra uh, that we have discussed. Uh, but I'm not going to go through that right now. In your homework, you may actually find something like that. So basically, from logic to gate, sum of products form leads to two-level logic, as we've discussed. Basically, the first level is ends of input variables and their complements, literals, basically ends of literals, as you can see. To get the min terms, you need ends. And to get the sum of products form, you need OR gates. So it looks like this, basically. So basically, this is the first level. This is, these are the AND gates that pro produce the min terms. And this is the OR gate that ORs the min terms that lead to a 1 in the uh, output. OK, so hopefully that's clear. Uh, this is fun and hopefully easy. Uh, now, uh, let me finish up the sum of products form with, with some uh, observations. Basically, any one-bit function can be represented as a sum of products. If a function outputs two bits, you basically have two different outputs uh, uh, that you represent as two different sum of products. right? But basically, we are looking at one-bit output functions here. And a product is a Boolean AND that includes all input variables of the function. And we call this a min term. The one-bit output of the function can be represented as sum or OR of all min terms that lead to a 1 in the output. Logically, uh, I like thinking of this, things logically, since this is all logic, right? The function evaluates the true. In other words, its output is 1 if any of the products or min terms causes the output to be 1. And sum of products form represents the function as a sum or uh, uh, of all products, min terms, that cause the output to be 1. So I basically uh, explained what we have gone through in detail uh, in one slide over here. Now, let's take a look at the alternative canonical form over here, which is the product of sums form. 
which will hopefully be a, a very uh, clear uh, since I think I think of uh, sum of products as an easy way of understanding, but product of sums is really the dual or, or the Morgan of SOP of uh, F pars essentially. Uh, so basically a uh, product of sum looks like this. Now, instead of focusing on the min terms, which are ones, we're gonna focus on the max terms, zeros, okay? And clearly, if you look at this function, uh, uh, this can be represented as by looking at the uh, outputs that lead to zeros. And this function is evaluated as a zero if, uh, basically, let me uh, put it over here. The function evaluates to false or its output is zero if at least one of the uh, sums or max terms causes the output to be zero. Hopefully, this makes sense, right? When is the function zero? If a, uh, if uh, you have this input combination uh, uh, to be evaluated to zero, uh, if, if, you, if any of these input combinations actually evaluate to zero, you get a zero. So basically, these are called products. Uh, and if any of the products, uh, oh, these are called sums, sorry. If any of the sums evaluates to zero, you get an output zero. That's why uh, we, we have a product of sums over here. If this is a zero, you should get a zero at the end. That's why you end everything. To get and, and the sums together. Okay, so let's go through this in a little bit more detail. Each sum term represents one of the zeros of the function, as you can see, uh, and you basically uh, end them together uh, for, uh, for those zeros. And this is called a max term, basically. So uh, the function evaluates to zero if this input combination is zero, uh, or this input combination is zero, or this input combination is zero, clearly, right? Uh, okay. And this is how we represent it, basically. So uh, for example, if, uh, if A is 0, uh, and B is 1, and C is 0, the output is 0, and the output of the function is also 0. And then you can, you can verify also that uh, that's true for these max terms as well. OK, I've already said this, basically. This input activates this term, and you get a 0 on the output. As a result, the function evaluates to 0. So for the given input, only the shaded sum term will equal 0. Uh, similar to what we have seen uh, in the product of sums. But in this case, anything ended with zero is zero. As a result, output F will be zero. So that's why you have the De Morgan of uh, sum of products of F, F prime over here. OK, so let's take a look at one example over here. So this is the realization. This is the uh, uh, realization of the function in Boolean expression. If you get an input 0, 1, 0, what happens is each of these evaluates the different val uh, values over here. Uh, and you can see that the function is uh, 1 over here, uh, 1 over here, and 0 over here. And you get a 0 at the output over here. So again, I've, I've, uh, I rushed through this, but uh, hopefully it's clear after you've seen the sum of products. Basically, only one of the products will be 0. And anything ended with the 0 is in the end 0, as you can see over here. The, the others will be 1, as you can see over here. OK. OK, I already said this. So how do you write uh, the product of sums? Uh, this is a little bit more uh, involved. Basically, you find all of the uh, outputs uh, that lead to a 0. Uh, uh, find the truth table rows where f or output is 0. And uh, basically, you have a, a 0 in the input column. That's a true literal. And if you have 1 in the input column, that's a complemented literal. So this is where some, things get a bit tricky. Basically, if you have a 0 uh, here, you, get, you write the true one and then do the or, right? If you get a one over here, you get the complemented B, as you can see over here, and then uh, you do the or with others. And the or, you or the literals to get a max term, and then you add together all the max terms, uh, uh, that, uh, which by definition lead to a zero. OK, uh, I think uh, I've already shown this, uh, so I'm not going to go through this in detail. Uh, OK, or you can just remember that product of sums of F is really the same as the De Morgan of the sum of products of F prime, uh, now that you know the Boolean algebra. So what does that mean? Uh, basically, that means that, so this is, uh, the sum of products form is this part, right? So what you're really doing is uh, F prime. F prime is the complement of this function. And if you take the De Morgan of it, what you get is the, uh, this function also. OK, if you didn't understand it, think about the Boolean algebra. Uh, you will understand it. But essentially, everything works out. Uh, and you can go through this on your own. Uh, OK, this is also called conjunctive normal form or max term expansion. Now you can do the same thing, basically. You can basically agree on uh, the naming of 
the max terms. For example, this max term is M0, this max term is M1, this max term is M2, corresponding to input combinations 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And then basically uh, uh, write the function uh, as uh, a combination or product of the max terms. Right? So this function uh, uh, that we saw earlier is a product of max terms 0, 1, and 2. That was the previous function. That's it, basically. Now, you actually, if you see the sign, you can clearly form the truth table of that function because we already agreed on a notation, right? And again, note that you form the max terms around the zeros of the function, OK? And uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is very important. This is not the complement of the function. This is the function itself, right? Function itself evaluates the zero for the max terms, basically. If you want to take the complement of the function, basically, you need to complement f, f over here. So it'll be 1, 1, 1 over here, and then zeros over here. OK, so we'll talk about some useful conversions based on what I just said, actually. So you can do the min term to max term conver conversion. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly also, because uh, this, you can study this on your own. It's basically very logical. You can rewrite the min term shorthand using the max term shorthand clearly uh, by re replacing the min term indices with the indices that are not already used. So as, we, as I've shown you earlier, uh, the same function can be represented as the combination of min terms or the addition of min terms 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or the multiplication of max terms that are not represented in the min term expansion over here, 0, 1, 2. And we've just proven that, actually, in the earlier slides. You can do the max term to min term conversion exactly the same way. You basically replace the product with a sum and uh, take uh, all of the uh, uh, indices that are not used. That's it. And then you can expand f. Uh, to f bar. So if you know the representation of f, it's easy to represent f bar. So basically, f is this. Uh, if, if f is the min term combinations 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, f bar is essentially the min term combination 0, 1, 2. Basically, all of the indices that are not used will be 1. Everything else will be 0. So this makes a lot of sense, clearly. Right? And you can clearly represent the max term uh, representation also, product of sums. And that also works over here. OK, and you can also the min term expansion of uh, f to max term expansion of f prime. I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but it essentially follows from what we have already said uh, over here. Uh, uh, but uh, basically, if, if you're taking the f prime of a function, uh, and if you already have the min term uh, expansion, you basically change the addition to multiplication and change the min term to max term. And this follows directly from the De Morgan's uh, rules, uh, if you think about it a little bit. OK, but these useful conversions are actually used to uh, specify functions uh, to computer-aided design tools, for example. And then computer-aided design tools uh, go, go and uh, do the logic simplification, which brings us to logic simplification a little bit more again. Uh, uh, let me see if there are any questions. I think I saw some discussion, but it seems like there are some questions that are answered already. So I'm not going to go through that. And it's hard for me to see the questions for some reason. OK, looks like there's some good discussion going on over here between you keep, keep doing that, and TAs can also join as well. OK, uh, as I said, now we've represented uh, these functions in a, uh, using Boolean algebra. We have represented these functions a standard way. We can simplify the SOP or POS form of any function in a methodical way. We start with the canonical SOP or POS form. And uh, the reason is it enables convenience and automation. Right? Basically, we start with a truth table. You represent as SOP POS form, and you apply Boolean simplification rules. I mean, you don't have to always start with a truth table. You can directly start with SOP POS forms with the min term expansion or max term expansion. Clearly, min term expansion and max term expansion is a representation of the truth table of a function, as we've discussed. Right? So we will see, for example, later how to do this for a full one bit adder. Uh, and I'm not going to do this right now uh, at this point, but we will see how to do that later on. But let's take a look at how to do it for this function over here. We've already done it for some other function, as you can see, but I'll, I'll just give another example. So this is function y. And you can see that it's a three input function. Assume that. Uh, and this is a sum of products form of this function y, right? Basically, uh, it has uh, min terms. Uh, 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 it has three min terms. Uh, and you can guess which min terms they are. This is min term 0, right? Uh, uh, and this is, I think, min term 4 over here. And this is 1, 0, 1. This is min term 5, for example, min term 0, 4, and 5. Uh, and you can basically directly implement this uh, using this two-level logic representation. And that looks nice. 
basically you get the min terms using AND gates. And of course, you need to have the complements as well. And then you OR the min terms that lead to a one. OK, but you can also uh, simplify this. You can clearly see that D bar C bar is common between these two expressions. So you can eliminate A. And then you can see that D bar is common across these expressions. So you can eliminate D bar as well, right? Uh, so basically, uh, uh, well, well, you can eliminate actually one of them. Basically, this leads to uh, this representation, D bar C bar plus uh, A B bar over here. Actually, uh, and then uh, this will uh, be the minimized or reduced form, as you can see. So you can basically apply Boolean transformation rules uh, to minimize a circuit, or you can implement the circuit by like this uh, by itself. And remember this two-level representation, because this is going to look very much like a programmable logic array that we will discuss uh, in a little bit uh, when we talk about different logic blocks. OK. But of course, this is uh, uh, hopefully uh, uh, occupies less area, as you can see over here, if you're customizing it. OK. Uh, there's something uh, I uh, let's see. So basically, uh, now that we have covered uh, uh, the Boolean simplification, I'm going to start covering some basic combinational blocks. And uh, we're going to take a break somewhere in between over here. Uh, so I'm going to use combinational building blocks used in uh, modern computers. And com essentially, these are uh, combinational logic blocks that are grouped into larger building blocks to build more complex systems. We don't want to represent everything at the gate level, uh, even, even with pictorial representations, essentially. We want to basically abstract things. We want to basically say, oh, this is an adder, for example, and I don't want to really represent at the gate level. If you really want to know the gate level implementation, go inside the module. But at the higher level, I want to see it as an adder, let's say. So basically, the reason for this is we can hide the unnecessary gate level details to emphasize the function of the building block. And you can also associate other parameters with the building block, depending on the underlying implementation. Right? We can say its delay is this. Uh, we can talk about its power characteristics and delay characteristics of the adder. So uh, basically, now we're going to look at uh, multiple things, decoder, multiplexer, full adder, and a programmable logic array, and a bunch of other things, actually, uh, that are not written over here. But we're going to mainly focus on these four components over here. Uh, so we're going to start with decoder. but uh, now that I realize, I think this might be a good uh, time to take a 10-minute break, uh, because this is really a good logical uh, place in the lecture to take a break, because I don't want to break uh, after talking about decoder. Uh, and then we start multiplexer, because clearly there is some uh, correspondence uh, between the two. So OK, uh, let's take a break uh, for 10 minutes. Uh, we'll be back uh, at essentially 15 uh, at the hour. And then we will continue uh, with decoder and these combination logic blocks. OK. I think we're back from the break uh, and can now continue. Uh, I see an interesting question. I'm not going to fully answer uh, the question. Basically, given a Boolean expression, can you prove the minimality or non-minimality of the circuit? I think that's a great question, basically. Uh, I think uh, people have looked at it a lot uh, in terms of circuit complexity theory. Uh, and uh, there are some things you can prove, and uh, it depends on also on the uh, circuit, uh, basically. Usually, you want to prove, uh, for example, the number of gates uh, with a given type of gates uh, that you have. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that turns out to be an optima optima uh, optimization problem. But you, uh, people, people found out that you can actually have lower bounds in terms of what you can uh, do. I recommend taking a look at the circuit complexity theory, which we're not going to cover in this case. but. Usually proofs are possible, basically, yes. Uh, OK, so now uh, let me delete the slide, actually, that I created dynamically uh, and focus on this slide. So now we're going to look at combinational logic blocks. We were at this part uh, of the lecture. We're going to talk about combinational logic building blocks used in modern computers. And we're going to start with a decoder and then talk about multiplexer, full adder, and programmable logic array which I already mentioned. Let's start with the decoder. And these are uh, logic blocks that are used essentially in all uh, systems. A decoder is essentially an input pattern detector. Uh, it's, a, it's again, implements a Boolean function that detects uh, a pattern. You have n inputs, and you have two of the n outputs. And depending on the combination of n inputs, only one of the two of the n outputs is asserted. So exactly one of the outputs is one, and all the rest are zeros, depending on which combination uh, you have in the n inputs, which uh, one or zero combination you have in the n inputs. 
So the one output that is logically one is the output corresponding to the input pattern that the logic is expected to detect. So let's take a look at two to four decoder, for example. It looks like this, basically. Basically, you have two input, uh, inputs, A0 and A1. And you have four outputs, two to the two, uh, to the n, basically, where n is the input uh, number of inputs. Uh, so output sizes, four outputs. And the output is one. Uh, one of the bits in the outputs is one, uh, depending on uh, the input pattern. So if the input pattern is 0, 0, y0 is 1, everything else is 0. If the input pattern is 0, 1, y1 is 0, and everything else is 0. If the input pattern is 1, 0, y2 is, uh, y, y2 is 1, and everything else is 0. And if the input pattern is 1, 1, as you can see, y3 is 1, and everything else is 0. So basically, you're decoding, right? Uh, this is an input pattern, a binary 0 in two bits. And you've decoded it into y0. You've decoded this one into y, uh, y1, decoded this pattern into y2, and decoded this pattern into y3. OK. And you can now represent it at a higher level, uh, module level, like this, basically. I have a 2 to 4 decoder, two inputs, four outputs. And it looks like this. Now I don't need to actually represent at the gate level. We're going to look at a gate level representation of it also. There could be multiple gate level implementations, as we will see, actually, over the course of this lecture. But you can now represent this as a module. And basically, don't, don't worry about the gate level, lower level implementation when you're designing something bigger. For example, decoder is very useful for decoding an address. We talked about row addresses, for example, right? I'm going to mention this again. But uh, if your address is 0, 0, you basically enable uh, y0, which is here. And that word line in DRAM, for example, we discussed, remember, uh, the rows in DRAM, for example, that, that can get enabled. If your address is 0, 0 over here, this could be uh, going to a DRAM row, enabling the capacitors and the bit lines, as we discussed earlier. Right? So this is very powerful for address decoding, for example, understanding what your input pattern looks like. Uh, OK. So I've already said, said this. Let's take a look at a gate level realization of this 2 to 4 decoder. So basically, it looks like this, right? <laughs> so uh, you can see that uh, there are four outputs, uh, four different outputs. And this output is 1, evaluates to 1 if A and B are both zeros. This output evaluates to 1 if A is 0 and B is 1. This output evaluates to 1 if A is 1 and B is 0. And this output evaluates to 1 if A and B are both 1s. So you can see that uh, this is your decoder uh, over here. Uh, and these different AND gates uh, never evaluate to, uh, uh, only one of the AND gates evaluates to 1. Uh, for a given input pattern, right? You don't have uh, two AND gates evaluating the one because clearly uh, they, are, they correspond to different uh, uh, rows in, in the uh, truth table, right? OK, so this is one implementation of the decoder uh, using this sort of gates. And you can see that if I apply A1, B0, only this AND gate gets enabled, and only this uh, output gets asserted. Everything else is 0. So if this is a row in DM, only that rows get, row gets enabled, and none of the other rows get enabled, if you will. And we're going to use decoder to actually uh, build memories later on uh, when we talk about sequential logic next time. OK, so uh, as I said, decoder is useful in determining how to interpret a bit pattern. Uh, clearly, now uh, with, uh, we're now detecting that the input pattern is 1, 0, based on the fact that this output is 1. If this output was 1, we would detect uh, the input pattern is 0, 0. Now you can actually distinguish different input patterns, clearly. So uh, if uh, it could be the input pattern could be the address of a row in DRAM that the processor intends to read from. We will see examples of this when we construct memories. Uh, or as we will discuss later on, as we will discuss, uh, talk about instruction decoders, as you will also build in your labs, it could be an instruction in the program, and the processor needs to decide what action to do. So we in, uh, as we will see later on, uh, in an instruction encoding, you have what's called an opcode. An opcode specifies what the instruction is supposed to do. Is it an add? Is it an and? Is it, a, is it an or? Is it a not? Is it a multiply? Is it a divide? Is it a subtract? They're all encoded using a different bit encoding. Let, let's say uh, you use five bits, for example, to encode what the instruction is supposed to do. So you use a 5 to 32 decoder, uh, five inputs, 32 outputs, and depending on uh, what the instruction encoding is, only one of the outputs would be enabled, and everything else uh, would be zeros in the outputs. Uh, and then you can basically figure out, oh, this instruction is telling the processor to do an add right? or to do an and, 
or to their multiply. And we will see this very soon in five lectures or so when we talk about instruction set architecture. So keep in mind, we're building up toward this space because this, logic, this logical building block decoder will enable us to decode, understand, interpret the bit pattern of the encoding of an instruction so that the processor can decide what to do with it. Okay. Later, of course, you can use this uh, understanding, this bit, uh, this wire can basically control, for example, the adder saying adder should do an addition. It could control, uh, as we will see in a, in a little bit, ALU, arithmetic logic unit. It could basically configure the arithmetic logic unit to do a particular operation depending on what the instruction encoding specifies. Right? That's why this input pattern detection is really, really important. And decoders are used essentially everywhere in our circuits. OK, so that's the decoder. Hopefully, that's clear. And now let's talk about multiplexer. So a multiplexer is also called a MUX uh, shorthand or a selector. I like selector because it's really selecting one of uh, multiple inputs, OK? Uh, so basically, it selects one of the n inputs to connect it to the output uh, based on the value of a log to the n bits control input called select. This is called a select input. That's why I like the name selector, but you will see multiplexer more common in general, or mux uh, uh, as a shorthand notation. So let's take a look at a 2 to 1 mux. This is the truth table, basically. 2 to 1 mux has actually three inputs, uh, three input values. Uh, two of them are data inputs, and one of them is called the select input. So depending on the select input, uh, one of the data input values uh, uh, determine what the output is. So for example, if the select input is 0, the multiplexer selects data input value 0. As you can see, y is the same as data input value 0 if select input is 0. If select input is 1, the multiplexer selects data input value 1 to be the output. You can see that also, right? Clearly, by just looking at this truth table, you can say this is a multiplexer because based on the select input signal, 0 or 1, where the output uh, is assigned to D0 in this case or D1 in this case. OK, that sounds good. And this is the module level representation of a 2 to 1 multiplexer. So you can see that there's a 1-bit select input and 1-bit data input, 1-bit uh, other data input, D0, D1, and then Y is dependent on the value of the select. If select is 0, y is equal to d0. If select is 1, y is equal to d1. Now, clearly, you can make these uh, multiple bits also. Select input can select between two different inputs. But this data uh, value can be 16 bits, for example. right? You may pass 16 bits uh, depending on the select input. If select input is 0, you, you, pass, you select these 16 bits to be the output 16 bits. If select input is 1, you select these 16 bits. In this case, we're, gonna sh we're, we're seeing a 1-bit. But if you want to do it 16 bits, you, you basically have 16 wires uh, that are part of D0 in, indicating each individual bit, and then 16 wires that are part of D1 indicating each individual bit, and then Y is also 16 wires. But uh, the wires that get connected to D0 to Y, uh, 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 the wires get connected from D0 to Y or D1 to Y, depending on the value of uh, the select. OK, now let's take a look at the underlying implementation, just like we did with the decoder. The, the, this is the underlying implementation of a 2 to 1 multiplexer or selector. Again, it's very simple, right? If the select is 1, uh, the output is 1. Uh, the output is B. If the select is 0, the output is A. And you can convince yourself that that's the case. So if the select is 0, this AND gate always evaluates to 0. So the output of the OR is very much dependent on this. And the output of the OR is essentially A, because if select is 0, this becomes a 1. And this, uh, the output of the AND gate is controlled by essentially A, uh, because uh, A ended with 1 is A, right? And you can do the other opposite also. If select is 0, uh, if select is 1, uh, this becomes a 0. So the output of this is 0. Essentially, the uh, output of this OR is controlled by whatever comes over here. And if select is uh, 1, like we discussed, uh, B passes through the AND gate, because uh, B and 1 is B, as you can see. OK, so hopefully that's clear. Uh, and uh, now that you know Boolean algebra, that's uh, very clear. So somebody said, basically, can we use that not input in front of a gate, or should we use inverters? So uh, depending on how the gate is specified, you can use the not input, or you can also use an inverter. So this bubble essentially means an inverter. It's, it's inverted. Underlying implementation can use an inverter or can use some other potential gate, let's say. Uh, uh, so somebody says, can we use an, or do we need to use an OR gate? Uh, so in this case, using an OR gate, but uh, I will later show you that uh, there might be other ways of implementing 
uh, this uh, using, for, for example, tri-state buffers. But again, uh, we haven't covered that. So assume that you're going to use an OR gate right now, but potentially you could use things like tri-state buffers. And there are multiple different implementations of a multiplexer also, as we will see later on. In this case, uh, what we're really doing is uh, one possible implementation of the multiplexer. So these are all good questions. Uh, so is the select always one bit or can it be multiple bits uh, if you have 16 data inputs? Yeah, of course, of course, as we will see in a little bit, basically. But if you're selecting between two items, it's always one bit. If you need to select between 16 items, yes, you need four bit, four, four bit select input. Okay, so uh, I, I basically emulated one example of this. If select is zero, clearly this is one. So the output of this is A. If select is zero, this becomes essentially uh, irrelevant because the output of this is zero and uh, A and uh, A ORed with zero is always A, right? So basically that's why this works uh, because of this two level uh, logic. Okay, so essentially the key idea is the output, of, output C is always connected to either the input A uh, or the input B. Output value depends on the value of the select line S. And this is the, multipl uh, the multiplexer representation that I showed you in a module level. Usually, uh, well, almost always you put whether it's a zero or one. Uh, in this case, we omitted it because we already discussed it. But if you really want to understand how the multiplexer, uh, which, which value the multiplexer pick, picks, you usually put, this is the zero select value and this is the one select value, for example, or the other way around. Uh, okay, in this case, for example, actually the zero select value is A. So you, this is a, a kind of convoluted truth table, right? It's not exactly a truth table like we have seen, but this is a cute truth table that uh, shows that if the select is zero, C, is an a, C becomes A. If the select is one, C becomes B. And now you can know that this is a multiplexer between A and B. Okay, so I will give you a task, but I'm going to actually fix this. There's another task, I think, in the homework that uh, gives you a little bit bigger multiplexer. But basically, draw the schematic for a four input, four to one mux. Uh, one of your fellow students asked the question of a 16 input mux. I'm not going to go to 16 input, but I'm going to give you the four to one inputs. And you could do it in two ways. You could do it at the gate level as a combination of basic and or not gates, like we have done. Let me go back over here. Over here. So this is the gate level implementation of a two to imp one input mux. You could similarly have a gate level impl implementation of a four to one input mux. In this case, of course, select signal will be two bits as opposed to one bit, and you will have four different inputs. So you will need to have four different AND gates, let me put it that way, and still one OR gate. Okay, uh, and uh, or you could do it as a module level, basically as a combination of two to one input muxes. Basically, you could, take, you could start with this module level representation and basically use multiple of those to get a four to one input mux. And let me show you both, actually, in this case. So this is the four to one input multiplexer. Uh, this is the module level representation. Clearly, if you have four inputs and if you want to select one of them as the output, you need to have log two to the four uh, select bits, meaning log two to the four is two, uh, essentially two select bits. And then uh, what, at, at the first level, uh, there are two multiplexer, two to one multiplexers that separately select from D, select between D0 and D1, depending on select zero bit, and D1, D2 and D3, depending on the select zero bit. And then based on what is selected, you have another selector or multiplexer based on the S1 bit over here. And you can convince yourself that, for example, if S0 is 0 and S1 is 0, you get D0 out. If S0 is 0 and S1 is 1, you get D2 out, right? If, there, if S0 is 1 and S1 is 1, you get D3 out, OK? So you can convince yourself that this works. But this is the underlying uh, gate level implementation as you can see over here. Here, uh, somebody asks, you don't have to use bubbles, as you can see, you can also use the complemented value over here. Essentially, this is the gate level implementation. Uh, so if S1 and S0 are both zero, uh, what happens is D0 passes uh, over here and nothing else uh, passes. As a result, you get D0 at the output over here. Okay, and you can take a look at uh, this. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so uh, so uh, somebody asked, why do we need multiplexers? So that's a good uh, question, basically. This is, you, you need multiplexers to make a decision potentially, right? For example, uh, you, uh, it's the, these are actually decision makers. Uh, so if you want to, for example, pass one value, depending on the outcome of something else, uh, you can basically use a multiplexer and pick the value. Uh, so uh, as we will see later on, uh, you, you might actually need to, uh, depending on uh, the uh, encoding of an instruction, 
uh, you may need to use a register uh, as the input uh, to your uh, adder, or you may need to use an, a value that's generated somewhere else. Uh, imagine that later on. Uh, and then you want to select between those. So depending on the encoding in your instruction, you basically pick the register value or something else uh, that comes from somewhere else. Okay, So that enables uh, a multiplexer. Or uh, remember when we talked about the row buffer right, in DRAM, we said that row buffer has many, many entries. Uh, let's assume that row buffer is 8 kilobytes. And you want to pick, uh, let's say, uh, one byte out of it. So you, you basically need to have a multiplexer that uh, 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 takes 8,000 of these bytes and picks one of those bytes. And essentially, that's a multiplexer. Uh, because you need to really select what you're reading. And we will see this also in, uh, in, when we build memories. Uh, you, you build a one, a one piece of the memory from a row, and then you select which part you really want. So basically, it's a, you, you can use it for decision making, or you can use it for selecting the data value that you really need, uh, et cetera. We will see many, many use cases as we go through this course. But that's a very good question, actually. And maybe in the next incarnation of the course, I'm going to give you an example of this at this point in time. Uh, okay, so let's talk about full adder uh, over here. Uh, uh, and clearly, adders are useful, and we're going to see how an adder is implemented. So we're going to talk about binary addition. So hopefully, you've already learned this uh, when, we, when you talk about it. It's, it's very similar to decimal addition. Uh, you go from right to left, except each of the values is one bit. So A0 is one bit, B0 is one bit. So basically, this is an m-bit number, uh, and each AI value represents one bit of the m-bit number. And this is the least significant bit, as you can see. Zero is the least significant bit. And we're adding two m-bit numbers. And we do addition one column at a time. And uh, each column, you basically add a0, b0. You get a sum. And you also get a carry out, basically. Just like you get a carry out in decimal addition, right? In binary addition, you also get a carry out. And then that carry out becomes the input for the next bit's addition. So in the next bit, you basically add a1, b1, and c1. You get a sum, and you get a carry out. C2 and dot, dot, dot in the end. And then basically, you, you keep generating the carry, which will be the input to the next bit, next most significant bit, let's say. So one bit addition is really uh, what you do within one column over here. We can represent the truth table of binary addition of one column of bits uh, with uh, two m bit operands. So this is it, basically. Uh, so uh, you're, uh, each of these is one bits, AI and BI is one bit carry i is also one bit. Uh, so you have a three input function in binary addition and two output function. Sum is one output and carry i plus one is another output. And I'm not going to go through the construction of this. Uh, uh, basically, you can construct each of these, right? For example, let me, let, let's pick one, for example, over here. Let's do this one. If a i is zero, b i is one, and carry i, input carry, is one, the sum is zero because one plus one is two in binary system that corresponds to zero, but you generate a carry that goes into the next bit. So this is basically how you generate one line over here. And then the next addition of the next uh, column takes that carry in. So basically, binary addition is really n one bit addition. So if you're doing a 32 bit addition of two numbers that are of 32 bit wide, you're doing 32 one bit additions. And this is the sum of products. You can now generate the truth table for one bit addition like this. And you can actually show the sum of products form. So this is a sum of products form, basically. I basically directly realized uh, the gate level realization from the sum of products form. And if you remember the sum of products form, uh, uh, S, let's take a look at SI. This is sum I. Uh, so sum I, you basically look at the uh, min terms. All min terms are the outputs uh, where uh, the, the, the lines in the truth table where output is a one. You can see that there are four cases over here. And for that to be a one, uh, either AI and BI should be zero and carry should be one. So you can see that that's, this is one of them. Here, AI and BI are zero and carry is one, actually. I think, well, I don't know. One of them, actually. Yeah, you, can, you can find that yourself. So this is clearly one, one, one. I can, say, I can uh, clearly say that this is the one, 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 right? And that basically goes into the sum. Uh, so basically, you find all the min terms. Uh, AI and BI are both zero, carry is one. Uh, that leads to a one. Or AI is a zero, BI is one, and carry is zero. Or AI is one, BI is zero, and carry is zero. Or AI, BI, and carry are all ones, basically. 
And you can go and look at this and make sure that SI is correctly connected to all of these min terms that actually lead to a one. And hopefully that's the case. So basically this is a sum of products form directly realized in two level logic. So these are all the min terms, as you can see. And uh, you or uh, the min terms that you need for a given output. Okay. And C, C I plus one, again, you do the same thing. There are four cases, there are four min terms for which carry I plus one is one. And then you connect the right min terms over here uh, to this OR gate. Okay, we've seen this before with the sum of products form, but I wanted to show you this one again. Now you can minimize this clearly, but I'm not going to minimize it at this point. This is called a full adder. Uh, now you can actually represent this with a module. Okay, now we're going to ignore how it's implemented underneath. It could be that sum of products form. It could be a programmable logic array implementation, which looks exactly like this, actually, in a little bit, we will see. Uh, but I don't care what it is, but this is my full adder, one bit adder uh, in binary. Uh, I'm going to abstract it away so that I can build bigger stuff. So let's say, what is that bigger stuff? Well, bigger stuff could be a four bit adder, right? Instead of having one bit adder, which is really the basics of everything, how do I build a four bit adder from these full one bit adders? Essentially, we're going to use four of these one bit full adders. Basically, to add two four bit binary numbers A and B, uh, we're going to use one full adder to add the least significant bits of A and B, set the carry into zero because it's the least significant bit. There's no carry coming out from anywhere. So that's our full adder, first full adder for bit zero. The sum is output and carry gets propagated to the next bit full adder. Next bit is bit one for both A and B, as you can see. Sum is calculated with the full adder uh, logic as we've seen earlier. But now we have a carry in coming from the previous adder, as you can see, and the carry out goes out to the next adder. Next bit is bit two. And again, the same thing happens. We calculate a sum directly using A2, B2, and C2, and we calculate a carry three directly using B2, A2, and carry two. And then the carry out goes to the next full adder, and this is the most significant bit. And we create this, calculate the sum, and we calculate a carry also, which may or may not be useful depending on what you're doing. Um, for example, you can detect an overflow. If your number doesn't fit into uh, four bits after you do this addition, uh, you, uh, this carry out uh, enables you to detect whether you have an overflow, for example. I'm not going to go through that right now, but uh, you, can, you can look at the arithmetic chapter uh, in the book, uh, in the Harris and Harris book. Okay, basically, this is our four bit full adder, right? Uh, it looks beautiful. Uh, it essentially does four bit addition. I'm not going to go through this again, but each adder is a one bit adder. We just connected them nicely in a fashion uh, that is called ripple carry. So uh, this is called also a ripple carry adder. What we have constructed just now is a ripple carry adder. Why is it called a ripple carry adder? Basically, we're basically rippling the carry. We generate the carry from one bit and we use it as an input to the next bit. Generate the carry in that next bit, use it as an input for the next bit, et cetera, et cetera. So basically the carry is rippling, which does not sound good for delay, right? Clearly, you cannot compute uh, the value that you get in the sum and the carry over here before you get this one. And clearly, you cannot compute this one before you get this one. Clearly, you cannot compute this one before you get this one. And this is the basic. So you start with that one. So triple carry adder is a nice way of building an adder, as you can see. Uh, but it may have a long delay. We will talk about delay later on. So ignore the delay for now. But clearly, this is functionally correct, right? This is a functionally correct adder. OK, and this is another way of representing it. But this is not a 4-bit one. Now you can make it a 32-bit. This is copied and pasted from your book. You can see figure 5.5. Essentially, it does the same thing, basically. Each bit is added, and then carry is propagated, as you can see. Of course, we're omitting about 27 uh, of these, or 28 of these over here. So this is a 32-bit adder. Okay, And this is one simple way of uh, designing a 32-bit adder by using clean uh, single bit, one bit full adders over here. Of course, the performance of this is not that great. So that's why your modern computers don't use adders like this in general, uh, especially if it's, if it's a number, 32-bit number edition, if it's a 64-bit edition. If it's a 128-bit edition, it becomes even worse, of course, right? Uh, OK, I don't know what happened over here. Let me get back. Uh, okay, so clearly the delay characteristics of, the, of this is not going to be that nice. Uh, 
So as a result, people have optimized the design, logic design of adders a whole lot. Uh, and if you're really interested, I would recommend looking into uh, the chapter from Harris and Harris that I'm going to mention a little bit. I think chapter five uh, talks about it. Uh, uh, but basically, people have tried to uh, design specialized logic. OK, I'm not going to build just a 32-bit adder just using one-bit adders. But I'm going to have specialized logic that generates the carries early on, for example, as much as possible, as much as in, in parallel. So we are going to optimize the logic. So this is one example optimization. I don't expect you to understand this or know this, but I, I want to emphasize it so that you can appreciate it. So basically, we don't want this carry to be generated slowly. Oh, carry 0, carry 1, carry 2, carry 3, carry 4, carry 5, dot, dot, dot. It takes a long time. We want to basically look ahead, meaning uh, we want to look at a lot of inputs at the same time in some way, in some smart way, and uh, basically generate the carry out of a four-bit block very quickly using a specialized logic. This is called a carry look-ahead adder. And again, you don't need to understand exactly how it works. Uh, the key point to understand is this is a specialized carry generation logic so that the carry is generated very quickly out of that four-bit block, as opposed to you wait one bit, the second bit, the third bit, uh, fourth bit. No, we want to have a specialized logic to generate this carry very quickly. And a lot of modern systems actually use this sort of adders where carry is generated uh, with a larger block so that uh, the next block uh, in the addition can do the computation in a pipeline or in parallel manner uh, with the previous block. So this is an example of specialization in the very lowest level of the combinational logic. And I wanted to point this out because Today is a time for heterogeneity, right? We, we, we basically saw that uh, modern building blocks of processors have really heterogeneous components, CPUs, GPUs, machine learning accelerators, video accelerators, vision accelerators, audio accelerators, et cetera. Uh, well, this is an accelerator at a combinational level, level that really accelerates your carry generation in your addition because you want to make your addition fast, essentially. So that's the idea over here. Again, you don't need to understand exactly how it works. Uh, there's actually some beautiful uh, logic theory that enables this, uh, so that this carry generates get, get generated much more quickly. Uh, but you can take a look at uh, uh, Harris and Harris chapter five. That's where this picture has come from, actually. Okay, so basically uh, the key takeaway is you can build a full adder, and using full adder you can build a bigger 32-bit adder uh, from one-bit adders, or you can build a specialized adder that looks like this. They all may have different properties. And this is just uh, three example adders that we just discussed. There are actually hundreds of different examples of adders that people have come up with, with different properties. And they all work based on different ways of organizing the combinational logic to do the addition. OK, so I'm, I'm not going to talk about adders anymore, but this is clearly a fascinating topic. In fact, there is a branch of computer engineering called computer arithmetic that talks about how you design these arithmetic units in a fast way. They talk a lot about adders. They talk a lot about multipliers, dividers, square root takers, for example. But we're not going to talk about a lot of those. Uh, I will refer you to your book for primitive versions of those uh, for now. OK, uh, let me switch gears a little bit and talk about programmable logic array. I alluded to it earlier. But this is actually a powerful way of expressing, uh, essentially, this is a programmable circuit that enables you to design essentially any function. So this is an example of a programmable logic array, actually. We didn't talk about that, but the sum of products form leads to two-level logic. And you can actually have a programmable logic that enables you to implement any function in sum of products form. You can also implement things in a simplified manner, but you can implement things in a sum of products form. So basically, a PLA enables a two-level sum of product implementation of any n input, m output function. So for this to work, the PLA needs to enable n inputs over here. And for n inputs, you need to have 2 to the n min terms. So a PLA actually has uh, a logic to enable 2 to the n min terms. And then uh, PLA enables you to program uh, which min term gets connected to an OR gate over here to get one bit, one bit output. And then you can have another one bit output over here which again, uh, PLA enables you to program which min terms get connected to that output. You can have another one bit output over here and PLA enables you to program which min terms get connected to that OR gate, let's say. 
And if you have M outputs over here, you have M OR gates over here, and that PLA enables you to program essentially uh, every, for every single output, which min terms get connected to that OR gate that decides the output. That's the idea, basically. It's, the idea is very simple in the end. I'm not sure, going to show you the connections over here, as you can see uh, uh, over here. So somebody asked, is it programmed via selector? We're not going to go, go uh, and talk about the details exactly, but it could be programmed via selector. Absolutely, yes. Muxes are one way of programming it. But again, that's one way. There are other ways, as we will see. Tri-state buffers could be another way. Uh, fuses could be another way, actually, if you want to do it, uh, if you can actually enable it. Uh, 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 if, if, you can, if you can have a programmable fuse, for example, I'm not going to go through the implementation of it, but yes, so very good. Uh, selector is one way of enabling that connection program. program. So basically, uh, as I showed you over here, we have ABC, we have XYZ. So you can implement now a three input, three output function. And connections over here, the programmable logic array enables you to connect any of the min terms to any of the OR gates that determine the output over here using selectors or fuses or tri-state buffers or pass gates, which we're not going to talk about. Uh, so there are many ways of doing this. Uh, so basically, this is a very common building block for implementing any collection of logic functions one wishes to. Uh, it's an array of AND gates, as you can see. Uh, and the output of that array is all of the possible min terms, followed by an array of OR gates. Uh, and the array of order gates can be connected to any possible connection, uh, combination of the min terms over here with the possible connections, as we will see in a little bit. Uh, and uh, how do we determine the number of AND gates? Once I, I've already given you that, basically. Remember the SOP? That's the number of possible min terms. If you have an N input function, you need to have two to the N uh, AND gates. I already said this, basically, because you have two to the N uh, rows in your truth table, uh, two to the N input combinations, clearly. OK, how do we determine the number of OR gates? This is really the number of output columns in the truth table. Basically, your programmable logic array needs to have at least that many uh, OR gates. If it has fewer, then you need to use multiple programmable logic arrays. Right? Clearly, that's true. So if I have a four output function, I can only generate three of these outputs over here. And I need another PLA to generate the four output function. OK, hopefully that's obvious. So how do we implement a logic function? As I said earlier, you connect the output of an AND gate to the input of an OR gate if the corresponding min term is included in the SOP. So clearly, uh, I already said this. And this is a simple programmable logic construct. It's the simplest that you can get, in my opinion. It's not necessarily the most area efficient, but it's clearly uh, now what you can do is this also opens up the path to uh, design uh, hardware automatically from a truth table representation. You can have the truth table. You can have the canonical form, SOP. And you can say, oh, I have PLAs all over my hardware. I'm going to directly program these. So this is very beautiful and powerful, as you can see. You don't just do uh, uh, logic minimization using the sum of products form. But now you can actually do logic synthesis, meaning you're programming your programmable logic uh, by uh, representing your function in the sum of products form. So it's beautiful, basically. So uh, some FPGAs are programmed using this way. High-level synthesis tools actually can enable you to program things this way. OK, so programming a PLA, we program the connections from AND gate outputs to OR gate inputs to implement the desired function. You could use it through, through the selectors. Uh, and uh, have you seen any other type of programmable logic? Actually, we've seen an FPGA, which we are going to use. An FPGA today use, can use PLAs, but usually they use uh, denser things, if you will. Uh, it, has, it uses basically more advanced structures like lookup tables, we, as we saw in lecture three, and as we will see in a little bit also in a different way. OK, so basically the PLA looks like this. Uh, and you can read h, &H chapter 561 over here, as you can see. You have the inputs, M inputs, and you have the AND array. AND array gives you all the implicants, which is really the min terms. And then you have the OR array over here. And then implicants get connected to the right uh, places in the OR so that you can actually generate the outputs using the SOP form. And this is what it looks like, basically. So programming the connection basically is uh, setting these uh, values over here uh, to blue. I'm not going to show that over here. But basically, you can, you can choose A bar, B bar, C to be connected over here. You can choose A, B, C bar over here. And you can choose A, B bar over here. Again, I'm not going to go through the details of it. Uh, but you can use selectors over here. You can use pass gates. You can use tri-state buffers, which we will see in a little bit. Uh, but Keep in mind right now that at a high level, programming means 
connecting uh, uh, the uh, things to the AND gate and OR gate. So, OK, let's pick one of them over here. So assume that we want A bar, B bar, C bar, uh, and uh, or, or A, B, C bar uh, as output of X. What do we do? In this part, we basically connect A bar, put a dot over here, this A bar, put a dot for B bar, put a dot for C. And if you put the dots, you basically connect all of these to an AND gate over here. And then you do the same thing for A, B, and C bar. You put the dots over here in this row. They get connected to an AND. Now you want to OR those two ANDs, meaning you put a dot over here and you put a dot over here. Now both of them get ORed, and X is determined that way. Clearly, you can minimize the logic uh, by omitting some variables as this as is done over here. If y is equal to a b bar, for example, you can just choose a and then b bar, and then they get input to an end, and then the result uh, goes to y. Of course, your PLA needs to be able to enable that sort of configurability. Uh, that's why uh, min terms are easier, clearly, right? Uh, because min terms are all inputs get connected to all end gates uh, in the end. OK, so clearly you can optimize your PLA and make it even more sophisticated as well. I'm not going to talk about. But this is, uh, this is uh, so what, what this looks like is, in the end, uh, mm, looks like this. But to be able to enable this, you may actually have selectors. You may actually have a lot of selectors that decide uh, which of these get connected to this one, which of these get connected to this one, which of these get connected to this one. OK, that may not be the best possible implementation. OK, so let's take a look at implementing a full adder using a PLA. So hopefully this is obvious by now, but this was actually uh, the, uh, the RPLA, right? Uh, we have three outputs over here, x, y, z, and three inputs, a, b, c. Remember, a full adder had three inputs, a, b, carry in, and two outputs, sum and carry out. So one output was not going to be used, clearly. And remember, this is our truth table, right? So basically, this is what we do. <laughs> we have the AND gate. We program the AND gate such that we pick the right min terms for SI and carry I plus one, and then uh, uh, direct, direct them to the OR gates. And this X output is not used. If you have a bigger PLA than needed, well, you have a bigger PLA than, than needed. You don't use the output uh, of one of the OR gates. OK, clearly, also, uh, some min terms are not connected to anything. Right? You can see that uh, if A is 0, B is 0, and carry is 0, Neither carry out uh, nor uh, sum uh, is a one. As a result, the output of this first AND gate is not connected to anywhere. Hopefully, that's obvious. And that's true for one of the other ones. Uh, well, actually, that's not true for any of the other ones over here, because at least one of the other ones uh, 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 leads to a one over here. So there's a question. Do we have less latencies now since uh, less gates are in sequence? Uh, well, I don't quite understand. Uh, uh, this uh, question. It really depends, right? Uh, it really depends on how you implement it. But if you have a general uh, PLA, uh, in the end, you have to have some latency. Uh, it's not as, it's, it's basically slower than a specialized logic uh, to implement this truth table in the minimal form. Because you have programmable logic and you have to program the connections. So they add latency, basically. So from that perspective, it depends on what you compare to. If you're comparing to a specialized logic, that is minimized to implement this full adder, you, have, you will have lower, uh, longer latencies. In comparison to ripple, so OK, uh, I do not look at ripple carry adder over here. This is a single bit adder, basically. So this is one, one bit adder. If you want to do a 32 bit adder, you still need to connect them uh, to each other. So in the end, the latency of a ripple carry adder will not necessarily change, because you will need to connect multiple PLAs together, basically. Or do something else, of course. Uh, OK. Uh, so, OK, uh, as I said, this input should not be connected to any outputs, and we do not need this output. OK, let me talk about logical completeness, because PLAs are a great example of logical completeness. Basically, they show that you can implement any function using just AND or NOT gates. Right. So what does this mean? Any logic function we wish to be implemented could be accomplished with a PLA. Uh, PLA consists of only AND gates, OR gates, and inverters, as we saw, and also some selection logic that we didn't really discuss, programming logic. Uh, we just have to program connections based on SOP, so sum of products form, of the intended logic function, as we've discussed. 
so basically, the set of gates and or not is logically complete because we can build a circuit to carry out the specification of any truth table we wish without using any other kind of gates. That's basically it. That's what the logical or functional completeness means. You can build a circuit to carry out the specification of any truth table, assuming, of course, you have enough inputs and you have enough outputs, right? Uh, so it's also true that NAND or not an AND is also logically complete, and so is NOR. So basically, you can build any logic function, any truth table using just NAND gates or NOR gates. And I'm not going to prove this, but your task is to prove this. And you can, you can do that relatively easily, in my opinion. So, so there's some question. Where are PLAs used in the general purpose CPU? So that's a good question. It really uh, depends. It could be, for example, used in some decoder, decoding function. Uh, for example, if you want to implement uh, enabled implementation of uh, a general decoder uh, in some way, uh, where you will later add instructions. You can actually have programmable logic uh, to do that. If you want to update the functionality, you, can, you want the programmable logic. Uh, so if you want to really customize, and so basically whenever you want programmability, this, uh, it could be a good place uh, to use a PLA. Of course, as I said, programmable logic array is a primitive form of programmable logic. There are other forms of programmable logic like lookup tables, uh, which we will later see briefly, uh, and which you, will which you will use when you use your FPGAs knowingly or unknowingly, hopefully knowingly, uh, that, are, uh, uh, that, that are used in modern uh, CPUs. So FPGAs are full of, let's say, newer versions of PLAs or programmable logic uh, that kind of look like this in some way uh, so that you can actually program any function in it. OK, so let's talk about more combinational blocks. Uh, uh, again, I'm going to refer you to uh, some of the uh, readings uh, as I said, nothing is required, but I think it's good to read some of these things because they answer some of the questions that I cannot necessarily answer uh, over here because there's limited amount of time. And they, they go into a lot of interesting detail also. So I'm going to cover the tri-state buffer and Z values in a little bit. Uh, chapter five will be required reading. So not all of it, but I think you will greatly benefit from reading the combinational parts of chapter five soon, sections 5.1 and 5.2. And I will, uh, I've already used some material from them, actually. I'll give you another function, comparator. Uh, basically, if you want to check the equality of two numbers, for example, compare if equal, if you're searching a pattern, for example, in uh, a, lot, a sea of patterns, if you want to check if the two things are equal, you use an equality checker or otherwise called a comparator. And this is a special case of a comparator. You're comparing if two values are equal. There's also a compare less than and compare greater than. Uh, you're basically comparing whether one value is greater than the other or less than the other. I'm not going to talk about this. You can imagine how to do it. You actually use a subtractor, for example, to enable that. But take a look at Harris and Harris uh, chapter that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so a four-bit comparator looks like this. Uh, so basically module level. Actually, you can have a one-bit comparator also that looks like uh, essentially the same. Uh, but basically, uh, your, your input values are one bit as opposed to four bits. So you have two data uh, inputs. And the comparator checks if they're equal, and the output is 1 if they're equal, if, and the output is 0 if they're not equal. Hopefully, this is obvious. And this is one way of implementing it. Clearly, you could implement this by designing the uh, SOP form. But you could also realize that comparison equality check is essentially an XNOR of each of the bits. Right. So for this to be true, for the two values to be equal, every single bit, the corresponding bit of the two uh, four-bit numbers have to be the same. What does that mean for them to be the same? For two bits to be the same, their XNOR should be one. Right? So this XNOR evaluates to one only if A3 and B3 are the same. And for all bits to be the same, every single XNOR gate should evaluate to one. That's why we have an AND over here. So clearly, this is one implementation of it. And it's a beautiful implementation, as you can see. OK, I'm not going to talk about comparators more, but clearly, comparators are used in many places. Uh, uh, if you want to decide on a value, if you want to check the match of a value, and we will see more uh, later on. So this brings me to arithmetic logic unit, which is essentially a, a, a composite unit uh, that combines a variety of arithmetic and logic operations into a single unit that performs only one function at a time. And we will see this when we build a processor. Now we're actually building a processor a component by component without putting them together at this point. Uh, so usually it's denoted with this symbol that looks like this. 
It looks like an adder, but it's not an adder. It's just, it's called an ALU, arithmetic logic unit. It has two, I mean, in this case, it has two uh, n bit inputs and one three bit function uh, input. This basically determines which function the ALU is supposed to perform on the input and an n bit output that gives the output based on the function and the data values of the inputs. That's the idea. So let's take a, a, take a, a look at a, an example ALU functionality. This is from your book. Basically, if the function is 0, 0, 0, you select A and B. Now you can see where a selector could be useful, like, right? Multiplexer. Essentially, you can implement a lot of function over here. And depending on what you really want to do at a given time, you select the right output. So if function is 0, 0, 0, this performs A and B or selects A and B, uh, the result A and B. If the function is encoded as 0, 0, 1, it could be A or B. If 0, 1, 0, it could be A. This is plus in this case. This is a real addition in this case. Unfortunately, we have overloading of terms. It's the addition of A and B. 0, 1, 1 is not used for whatever reason. 1, 0, 0 is A and not B, et cetera. And this is A minus B, as you can see. And this is shift less, uh, set less than as you will see when you implement your MIPS uh, instructions uh, later on. I'm not going to talk about it. You can read the chapter associated with arithmetic logic unit if you really want to know what that is. But basically, this is what the arithmetic logic unit looks like at a module level. Again, I'm not going to go through the details of it, but you can see our selector. Our selector, uh, there are two selector selectors, actually. One selector is here, one selector is over here. Uh, and depending on the three-bit value of f, you, uh, the output is either this or this or this or this. And then you also have the selection that goes into this adder over here. So this is a sophisticated ALU, but it's not really that sophisticated also because there could be much more sophisticated ALUs. But you can see that, for example, if the function is 0, 0, 0, we're going to select this, right? And that's essentially uh, the end of A and B. So let's take a look at how it operates. You get the end, but so it's an, it's this an N input end. So you have the A that goes here. And then B, that goes here. So if the function is 0, this multiplexer passes B. And then A and B flows through here. And only this one gets selected because we said 0, 0, 0, right? You can also see A or B if, the, if uh, this is 0, 0, 1. And you can have fun with it and look at how you get A plus B. Actually, let's take a look at A plus B, 0, 1, 0. Basically, that's 2 over here. You need to select this one. So it comes out of the adder, uh, but uh, F2 is zero. So B gets uh, in, uh, as input uh, for the second input of the adder and A is always the first input of the adder. So you get A plus B. Okay, you can have fun based on, by combining these blocks. Now we are combining selector, uh, adder, or, and, and there's a zero extension block basically that adds zeros to the top end bits, which you don't need to think about at this point. Uh, and a, another multiplexer over here, as you can see. Okay, so this is one example of an arithmetic logic unit. So if you want to look at more combinational logic blocks, see uh, H&H chapter, Harris and Harris chapter 5.2. They describe a subtractor. Uh, they describe a shifter and a rotator, multiplier, divider. Now, we're not going to really talk about multipliers and dividers as much, but it's good to know. Subtractor is always good to know. And this also introduces two's complement representation, which is a good way of doing uh, subtraction and, and representing numbers so that you can do addition and subtraction nicely. And shifters are rotators are basically moving bits in one value to uh, uh, other bit locations uh, in the output. Okay, as I said, uh, there are more combinational blocks that I'm not going to cover right now. But let me cover tri-state buffer because it's going to be interesting. Uh, and it's going to introduce some new concepts also. Uh, basically, a tri-state buffer enables gating of different signals onto a wire. So why is this interesting? We will see in a little bit. So this is what the truth table of tri-state buffer looks like. And it looks a little bit different from what we have seen so far. So let me take a look at the structural view first. So basically, there are two inputs, A and E. A is the data input. E is the enable input. And Y is the output, as you can see. So basically, it's like a buffer, but it can be enabled or disabled. OK, what does that mean? If the buffer is enabled, Y is equal to A. Basically, the buffer simply passes the value of A to the output. OK. But if the buffer is not enabled, meaning if it's disabled, A does not determine Y. Y is just floating. It's called Z. Basically, it's an open circuit. 
Okay, so now I've introduced the notion of a floating signal, signal that is not driven by any circuit. It's called an open circuit or floating wire. If you're not going to, if you don't want A to drive any other wire, basically you select uh, this enable to zero so that A does not drive uh, the output wire and whatever it's connected to gets Z and somebody else can drive it. Okay, so hopefully this is uh, clear. You will see more of this, more and more of this as we will discuss. So why is this interesting? Or why, where could this be used? Uh, this is a little bit less intuitive. That's why I have to uh, talk about it. I think decoders, multiplexers are more intuitive because they enable you to uh, select things or make some decisions, enable different things. But here, imagine a wire connecting the CPU and the memory. And at any time, only the CPU or the memory can place a value on the wire, but not both. Because if both of them place a value, you get garbage. You get a short circuit, which is bad. You want only one of them to place a value. So now you can, have, you can implement this logical functionality by having two tri-state buffers. One is driven by the CPU and the other is driven by the memory. And ensure at most one is enabled at runtime by, uh, at any time by controlling the enable signals of these tri-state buffers. Now, let me show this pictorially to you. You're gonna see this later on when we talk about microarchitecture and constructing a system uh, that looks like this essentially. So you have a shared bus, it's a wire. Bus is the name of the wire essentially. It's one type of interconnect. Uh, at any given time, CPU can load a value onto the bus so that let's say uh, you uh, write to memory or uh, memory can load a value into the bus so that goes to the CPU in some way. Uh, but basically, if you want to load or if you want to put a value onto the bus, you use a tri-state buffer. So if you set gate CPU to one and gate mem to zero, CPU drives the value on the bus. And this gets disconnected over here you can think of this like an open transistor, right? Like we have discussed earlier. This is an open circuit. The value here does not get connected to the value here. As a result, the value here gets driven by gate CPU. Now, if you set gate mem to one, gate CPU to zero, the opposite happens basically. The value is driven by the memory, okay? Now, you, don't, you never want to set gate CPU to one and gate mem to one at the same time because both of them now load the value, put the value on the bus. And as a result, you get garbage. But you can set gate CPU to zero, not enabled, gate mem to not enabled, so that neither of them uh, put something onto the shared bus, right? Okay, so from your book, this is another picture. In real systems, it's actually used this way. It's, in fact, you actually have a tri-state buffer that goes from processor to bus and from bus to processor. So two tri-state buffers, as you can see over here. And video engine, ethernet engine, memory engine, they may all use a shared bus. And again, you have four different enable signals over here. We're looking at the two bus signals over here. At any given point in time, you have to enable only one of them. Otherwise you get garbage. And you can see that the tri-state buffers enable you to control who gets to put a value onto the shared bus. And again, you can take a look at your book for this. And we're gonna use this later on when we construct the microarchitecture. It's gonna come in very, very handy. So tri-state buffers are interesting because you can actually implement a multiplexer using tri-state buffers as well. As I said, multiplexer can be implemented in different ways. So this is a way of implementing the multiplexer. So basically the select signal of the multiplexer, you're selecting between data value zero, data value one. If the select signal is zero, uh, if the selecting signal is zero, D zero gets connected to Y and D one doesn't get connected to Y because this is zero. If select signal is one, this becomes disabled and D1 gets connected to Y directly, D0 does not. So logically, Y is equal to D0 and S bar plus D1 and S. You can actually, this is really an AND gate, if you will. Uh, and you can think about that a little bit. And now you can actually use a four to one multiplexer. You can build a four to one multiplexer using four tri-state buffers and four input values and uh, having the enable signals uh, controlled by uh, the uh, end of uh, the literals of S0 and S1, as you can see over here, right? So these are, uh, if you will, the implicants uh, or min terms, uh, yeah, implicants, I should say, uh, that are associated with S0 and S1. Okay, so hopefully this is uh, also obvious. Uh, so there's a question, are trace state buffers cheaper than gates? So that depends basically, that depends on the implementation technology, et cetera. Sometimes they may be leakier and not so good, but it really depends on how you implement them. And that's really below our level of abstraction, but that's a very good question. Okay, so multiplexers can also be used as lookup tables to perform logic functions. We talked about lookup tables. So multiplexers are actually very nice, as you can see. They're not just selectors. 
the selection functionality can be used as a lookup table. So for example, here I have A XOR B. A XOR B looks like this. This is our function, right? So if um, uh, uh, basically if A is zero, you select B. If A is one, you select B bar. Uh, I think so. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, because that way you actually uh, decide uh, the number of ones and zeros you have. Basically, that's a multiplexer, right? Now we are expressed the XOR function as multiplexer. And that's our multiplexer. If A is zero, we select B. If A is one, we select B bar. Cool, cool right? So th there are many ways of implementing logic, as you can see, uh, a logical function. And you can use multiplexer-based logic also over here, which is actually a really interesting and nice way of uh, designing uh, logic if you can do it uh, this way. OK, this is another example. This is logic using multiplexers. Again, this is a lookup table. Now we actually have a lookup table over here. Uh, so this is our uh, truth table. And basically, uh, we're going to use our inputs as select uh, uh, bits, select uh, values. So for example, if A, B, C, uh, so uh, for all input combinations where the input combination evaluates to uh, one, uh, we connect those values at the input of the multiplexer to VDD, meaning one. Everything else we connect to zero. So basically, depending on the input combination of A, B, C, we select a one or a zero by appropriately formulating the truth table into the multiplexer. So what we have done essentially is formulated the truth table as an eight to one multiplexer here, right? If A, B, C are all zeros, that is connected to one. If A, B, C are zero, one, one, that is connected to one. If it's one, zero, zero, that's connected to one. It's if it's one, zero, one, that's connected to one and everything else is connected to zeros. Okay, so decoders can also be used to build logic functions. They can be combined with ORs as you can see. So this is the function A, X, nor B. So you can see that decoder outputs the min terms over here. This is two to four decoder. And then you basically pick the right min terms that go to your outputs. This is very similar to a PLA actually, if you will. So a PLA is actually, I mean, not exactly because decoder really provides you some of them, but you can appropriately pick which min terms you put uh, to the or over here. So I'm not gonna talk about this more, but uh, you can now see exactly how you can build logic functions with multiplexers and decoders. There are other use cases for decoders and uh, multiplexers, as you can see. Okay, let me quickly finish up the logic simplification. We, we, we already talked about this, but I'm going to quickly uh, spend five minutes. And I know we're almost over time. You can watch the video later on. I'm not gonna add any real new information, if you will, but I wanted to cover, now that we've seen everything, let's take a look at logic simplification of the full adder. I mean, we've already seen this in a way so basically our goal is a simplified full adder. And this is what we can get actually. So how do we get from here to here? There are many ways actually. So S, S is the sum function. It's A XOR B XOR C in. And C out is A B, A and B plus A and C in plus B and C in. This is also called the majority function. Basically at least two of A, B and C in should be true for this to be true. It's also called majority logic, if you will. And clearly this is XOR. So we can simplify this truth table to this. How do we do it? Well, I think hopefully you've already seen it, but uh, let me give you some uh, more automation type of rules quickly. So the original Boolean expression may not be optimal clearly. So this is one example that, I sh that we just cooked up. Clearly this is not optimal, right? The question is, can we reduce a given Boolean expression to an equivalent expression with fewer terms? Like it. this is F A plus B, right? So the goal of logic simplification is to reduce the number of gates and inputs and reduce implementation cost. But again, as I said, there could be other goals like uh, uh, minimizing the delay, minimizing the power. Those become more sophisticated because now you need to do the mapping to the gates with particular types of uh, power and delay characteristics. So this is really the basis for what the automated design tools are doing today. So uh, we can have systematic techniques for simplifications that are amenable to automation. I talked about some of them. You start with the SOP form, for example, and we use a key tool called the uniting theorem. And what does that mean? That's, this is a very fancy word for basically saying, figuring out what, what inputs do not matter for the output. So let's take a look at this example over here. Uh, so if you have this function a, b bar plus a, b, uh, b's value changes within the rows where f is equal to one, right? So f is equal to one over here. B's value changes zero, one. 
This is also called on set, where f is equal to one, or true set, basically. The output is true. Uh, essentially, b does not matter for this, right? That's the realization. That's the uniting theorem. For, these op for this, b does not matter. What matters is the value of a over here. So now a's value does not change within the onset rows. So if an input can change without changing the output, that input value is not needed. So a b is eliminated, a remains. So you can really express this function as a. And it's kind of obvious, right? We could have said that by just looking at a. But we also look at, OK, let's take a look at b. When the function is on, meaning the output is true, b's value really doesn't matter. b's value is 0 or 1, the function is still 1. As a result, we can eliminate b over here, and the output only depends on c. Oh, it depends on a. You could do it for every single input variable. So you could have a you could have had a C, D, E, F, G, H, I input variables. Do the same thing. Use the uniting theorem. You can eliminate uh, uh, inputs whose values change without changing the output. Okay, and this is really amenable to automation. Let's take a look at another example over here. G, in this case, uh, G's value is one in these two rows, and A's value changes. So G is independent of A. I can clearly say that, All right? B's value stays the same within the onset rows. And A's value changes. A will make B remains, but G is B bar because G is the inverted version of B. OK. OK, so the essence of simplification is find two elements, subsets, of the onset where only one variable changes value. This single variable, varying variable, changing variable can be eliminated. OK, let me give you an example of the priority circuit. This is actually a very interesting circuit. Uh, and again, if you need to drop off, feel free to drop off. You can watch it later. And this is also an extra material, if you will, because we've covered all of the essentials. But a priority circuit can have inputs as requesters with priority levels uh, and outputs with a grand signal for each requester. For example, I have this bus. Uh, I have a priority level. So I have a CPU, GPU, machine learning accelerator, and an automated braking system. In a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a pedestrian detector, right? Uh, which one do I prioritize? Well, automated braking system might be to the one to prioritize over the pedestrian detector over, I don't know, maybe a GPU and a CPU, depending on what they execute. So basically, a priority circuit prioritizes. A four-bit priority circuit prioritizes who gets the grant signal. So a requester is request uh, the signal, let's say a particular resource, and uh, uh, the priority circuit gives the grant signal. So this is an example of the truth table representation. For example, this is the priority circuit. A3 has priority over A2, has priority over A1, has priority over A0. So if A3 is set, the output should be Y3. A3 should be granted, as you can see over here. If A2, if A3 is not set and A2 is set, the output should be Y2. If A2 and A3 are not set, but A1 is set, the output should be uh, Y1 should be 1. If A0 is set and none of A3, A2, and A1 set, the output should be Y0, 1. And if none of them are set, no one should be granted, as you can see in the first row. So this is a simple priority circuit. And you can use it for static prioritization or even dynamic prioritization in circuits. So how do we minimize it? Well, you can do essentially what we have done. Uh, but I'm going to give you another method to minimize it. And this is another realization. So there are many, many ways of doing things uh, in circuits and logic design. This is another way of representing the circuit. I'm going to introduce another term, interestingly. So you can see that uh, 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 I'm going to compact this truth table, A3, A2, A1, A0. If all of them are 0, the output values are 0. If the 3 are 0 and A0 is 1, the output value of only Y0 should be 1, because Y0 should, is the grand signal for A0, and the grand signal for everyone else should be zeros. Now, if the A3 and A2 are both zeros, A1 is 1 the value of A0 really doesn't matter, right? Because A1 has priority over A0. We know that. And we indicate this doesn't matter with an X. It's called a don't care. It means I don't care what the value of this input is. The output is going to be this, which is Y1 is 1 and everything else is 0. Again, you can do the same trick. If A3 is 0, A2 is 1, the values of A1 and A0 don't matter because they don't get prioritized. The priority is A2 is higher priority. As a result, the output is this, regardless of the values of A1 and 0. And again, if you look over here, if A3 is 1, it doesn't matter what A2, A1, and A0 input values are. 
the output is one uh, at uh, y3 over here, and everything else are zero as outputs. So now we have a much more compact form. And we can actually implement this by just looking at this, actually. We can directly implement this. Again, again y3 is directly a3. Uh, so you can use the don't care values to minimize the circuit, basically. Uh, to your advantage, basically. And I'm not going to talk about exactly how you do it right now, but you pick the right value so that you can minimize the circuit. And this is the minimum circuit that you get in the end. OK, so what I'm not going to talk about is logic simplification using a notion called Carnot maps. This is a pictorial way of minimizing circuits by visualizing opportunities for simplification. It's actually a beautiful way. Uh, it's a nice way uh, from a human perspective. Machines really don't use Carnot maps. But it, it, whenever you're learning about logic simplification, I would recommend looking into it. But because it's not used in practice in design automation, I'm not going to talk about that in detail. Uh, I've already given you everything that the machines really use uh, to actually minimize things. We just didn't do exactly what the machine does. What are the algorithms? That's the, really the subject of a logic synthesis course. Where, what we're doing is logic design, not logic synthesis. Uh, but Carnot maps, I would recommend uh, that uh, you look at them on your own. Uh, you can see the backup slides, which come essentially after everything else uh, in these slides. And you can also watch the videos of lectures five and six from uh, 2019 DDCA course. In last year, we eliminated this because I think uh, it's really not needed, even though they're really fun. Basically, they enable you to figure out a minimal form of a function uh, by uh, pictorially representing the function uh, and uh, getting rid of uh, some of the input uh, combinations. And you do this, the key thing that Carnot maps use is really the uniting theorem that I showed you over here. Basically, if the value of the output doesn't change, whenever you look at it pictorially in some way, if the value of an output doesn't change, but the input changes, you can eliminate that input. You just look at the other inputs to dictate the function value. And that's the key idea in a Carnot map. And you do it by visualizing uh, opportunities for simplification. And OK, so that's all I want to say, actually, about Carnot maps. The rest is really slides that talk about how to do this with Carnot maps. I'm not going to cover that. But I would recommend you take a look at it because it's fun, but we just don't have enough time. We cannot cover everything clearly in this course. Uh, but I recommend you take a look at it because it's really, it's really fun. And there are examples of two-bit comparator, for example, uh, how you actually uh, express it and minimize it. OK. This is where I will stop. Uh, any questions at this point? Any burning questions, I should say? I don't see anything over here. But hopefully, this was uh, really interesting. Now you've got actually essentially the basic building blocks of combinational logic, plus how to simplify them. Uh, and if you really want to know about Carnot maps, please take a look at the slides, as well as the uh, uh, lecture uh, videos uh, that I mentioned over here from 2019 that essentially cover these slides. Uh, again, it'll be fun, but <laughs> uh, and 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 you will appreciate it, I think. Uh, okay, so no questions, I see. Uh, so I wish everyone uh, a, I guess happy Thursday evening. Uh, so we will announce what happens to tomorrow's lectures because we have actually some faculty candidates tomorrow. Uh, we will need to decide what to do with the lecture because it overlaps with some faculty candidate talks. Uh, uh, I will let you know uh, over the Moodle uh, uh, and I guess also on YouTube uh, what we will do to, to, for tomorrow's lecture. Until then, uh, take care and have more fun with combinational circuits.